And I don't know about any of you, but most times when I come to any given Sabbath, a lot of times I think back on various experiences I may have had in the past, whether they may have been good or maybe not so good. Um, I'm not sure how many of you here may resonate with that, but this morning a certain instance just came blaring into my mind, and I was thinking to myself, man, I can't believe I just did that. It's a little embarrassing, but I'll share it with you anyway. So I was in second grade, and I was in math class. For anyone that knows me, I hate math. Never enjoyed it. But I worked at a financial firm, so it, it, I, uh, <laughs> uh, God's funny in that way. But, <laughs> but I, oh man, I despised math growing up. I was never really good at it. Give me any subject, any, you know, I'll study, I'll ace the test, but math, whew, took, always took me a lot of extra efforts. And I remember this particular day in second grade, we were going over fractions. And oh man, that was, I thought it was over at that point. I thought it was over, and I wasn't getting it. I was trying to pay attention, but I couldn't. I was just wrestling in my mind. It just wasn't clicking for me. And so, as was the usual custom, uh, the teacher of the class gave, handed out all of us assignments for all of us to work on at home and bring back the next day for a grade. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I don't want to do this. I don't really feel like it. I'm struggling now, and I don't feel good now. I don't want to feel this way at home when I'm supposed to relax. And so, as I was walking out of class, I had the homework in my hands, and I crumpled it up, and I quit, threw it in the trash can, and I walked out of class. And I was feeling free. It was such a liberating feeling, but it came back to really get me later that day. You'll find out how. So, my usual schedule when I went back home is I would eat a snack, or I would eat Whatever it was that my parents prepared, I would do my homework, and then I would ride my bike, or read a book, or just be active, or just do regular child stuff. And my parents knew my schedule very well, so when I came home that same day, I ate, but I had no homework. So I went right into playing, I was running around laughing, giggling, yeah, woo, I was feeling free. But my mom came to me and asked, huh, do you not have any homework today? And I said, uh, no, 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 I, I do not have homework today, which technically wasn't a lie because my homework was in the trash at school. I didn't have it, so I didn't have homework. So uh, that's, uh, that's how I thought I could get out of that. And so she said, okay, all right. And so unbeknownst by me, she left me doing whatever it was I was doing, and she picked up the phone, and she called my school, and she was being transferred to each and every one of my classes to really find out if I did not have homework. And one by one, all my class, all my teachers were giving her the same answer. Nope, Sam doesn't have homework. Nope, he finished it in class, so he's good. Nope, I didn't give him any assignments today. And my mom found herself thinking, wow, hmm, maybe he doesn't have homework today. This is new, it's nice. And she came to be transferred to my math class. And... She picked up the phone and she asked the same question she asked every other teacher. Hi, this is Sam's mom. I'm wondering, does he not have homework from you today? Did you not give any homework out? And you know what my teacher said? You know, it's funny that you say that because right before the, the phone rang, I was on my way out and I just happened to have looked over at the trash can and I saw Sam's homework crumpled up in the trash and then I heard you call. Do you think he threw it away by mistake? You know what my mom said? She said, no, we'll be there in 15 minutes. We'll be there in 15 minutes. And then she found me, and she gave me that look. Like, she looked at, like, some of you know what I'm talking about. She gave me that look that all mothers know how to give. I don't know how they do it, but she looked at me, and I just knew I was in trouble. And I did something, I, this is something I did for the first and the last time. I ran. I ran, and I hid. I was like, oh, no, because I knew what was going to happen. I was like, no. And so I went downstairs. I was hiding under the table, and I thought, okay, this is a good spot. I don't think she's going to find me. And I could hear my mom saying, Sam, don't let me find you. Do not let me find you. Come out right now. And I was, I was, I was scared. I was terrified. terrified. I, thought this was like, I thought this was it for me. I thought this was like my last day. And she was looking. I kept hearing her, Sam, say, Sam, where are you? Do not let me find you. And I thought, okay, okay, I'm just going to hide here for a bit, and maybe she'll calm down, and, you know, maybe I can come out. 
Well, I never knew my mom was so strong. So she found me. I think my foot was like out from underneath the table. And so she picked me up with one leg and she had my belt in the other. And I'm pretty sure we all can guess what happened from there. <laughs> Praise the Lord for the love of a mother. Amen. <laughs> oh, wow. And so these are the sorts of situations that sometimes come blaring into my mind of, wow, I can't believe I really did that. can't believe I really did that. But however, I can't help but wonder how many of us may have similar experiences. And not to say that we may have gone through similar experiences with an actual earthly parent, maybe, maybe not, but... I just wonder how many of us have actually gone through similar experiences with our Heavenly Father. Because don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that God is going around, you know, oh, you know, oh man, you better come clean, or hey, you better, you better repent, and then, you know, God's holding like a belt, like, oh, don't let me find you. No, we don't serve a God like that, praise the Lord. But if we're honest with ourselves, the flip side is also true. It's that many times when we find ourselves pressed up against the wall, feeling as if there's no way out, feeling scared and ashamed and guilty, many times, if we're honest, we hide from God. We hide from Him. Beloved, the title of our study this morning is, Where Are You? Where Are You? We're going to spend a good chunk of our time in Genesis chapter 3. I know that this is a, I know this is Adventism 101, Genesis chapter 3. I know this is a very familiar story for all of us, but at the same time, it never hurts to give stories like this a second glance, because you never know when you might see something you've never seen before. Our goal is to really analyze the situation of, the, of where Adam and Eve hid from God and to also find the, uh, certain details that can be beneficial for us in our own walk with God. As we study, we're going to be observing very specific details that we can use to strengthen our lives in Jesus today. And before we continue with our study, let us take time to have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, eternal God, we thank you so much for the privilege of being here in your house today, studying the Word of God with one another. And Lord, it is our prayer, it's my prayer, that we not hear the ramblings and babblings of a man, but we want to hear the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, speaking to our hearts today. This is our prayer. In his name we do pray. Amen. So let us open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, and we will be starting from verse 1. Genesis chapter 3, and we will be starting from verse 1. So the Bible says here, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now notice verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So let's pause right here for a moment, because already we've seen so much. Again, I know this chapter is very familiar to very familiar, rather, to a lot of us, but right now we're just wanting to build a firm foundation for our Bible study this morning. So what have we seen so far? Well, right from the beginning of the chapter, we're introduced to two characters, right? We're introduced to the serpent, and we're introduced to the woman. Now, beloved, who is the serpent? Yeah, Satan, the devil, that's correct. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we know that the serpent is the devil. Now, what do we know about Satan? Is, is he our friend? Who? No. It is the exact opposite. 
The Bible says in John 10, 10, speaking of the devil, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. So with his subtle nature, what has the devil come to do in this woman's life? Yeah, he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's come to steal her identity in Jesus. He's come to kill her chances of having an intimate relationship with God. And he's come to destroy her confidence in God himself. So with the serpent identified, we now need to ask ourselves, who is the woman? Of course, there's only so many options at this point in Scripture to choose from. Of course, we know this woman is Eve. And now what do we know about her? What do we know about Eve so far at this point in Scripture? Yeah, she was created perfect. And what else? What else do we know about Eve so far? She was supposed to stay with Adam. That is true. That is true. Now, this may have been mentioned, but something important that I want to bring up is that she was made in the image of God himself, right? And we know this from Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 26, the Bible says there, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over all the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So, as the passage states, male and female, they were created in the very image of God. Now, what does that mean? To be created in God's image. Well, friends, this means that humans are like God in moral, spiritual, and intellectual likeness. God created Adam and Eve to reflect his own divinity. Attributes like creative freedom, the power to think and to do, the ability to reason, making choices, And self-awareness are all attributes that God has himself, and these are the very same attributes that he instilled into Adam and Eve at creation. And to no other creature has God given all of these gifts to other than humanity. Is this making sense so far? Okay. So, with all of this in mind, for what reason, for what reason does Satan want to steal kill, and destroy Eve's life. Exactly. He wants to destroy the image of God. Now, let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14, and starting off at verse 12. Isaiah chapter 14, reading verse 12. And when we're there, please let me know by saying amen. Amen. We're quick this morning. Isaiah 14, starting at the verse 12, speaking of Satan, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, notice verse 14, this last part where Satan says, I will be like the Most High. Now, this is a callback for us to remember what God stated in verse uh, 26 of Genesis chapter 1. Adam and Eve, mankind, all of us were created in God's image and his likeness. But here we find that Satan, he's saying that he wants to be like the Most High. Beloved, with the creation of the world, God gave to humanity attributes that only he alone possesses. But not only that, he instilled in humanity the divine opportunity to continue growing in these attributes. For example, 
1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16 say, But just as he who, who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, the Bible says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your, seed, your, your sowing, rather, your seed for sowing, and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So, beloved, God instilled these attributes that we were referring to earlier into humanity for the purpose of fully reflecting the character of God, for fully reflecting the image of God. And not just that, but to continually grow as we do so. We were made for perpetual progress. Meanwhile, Satan, he only covets to be like God for all the wrong reasons. He wants to position and power, but not necessarily the righteousness and the character and the obedience that comes along with it. Are we together? Now, Adam and Eve, they were created with innate opportunities that Lucifer wanted. And this is why he wants Eve to fail. He, he wants to do away with the image of God. Because in his mind, he's thinking, if I can't have it, if I can't have what I want, then nobody can. And this is why we find him in the garden. As we saw in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, saying, Ye shall not surely die. He's doing the very best that he can to instill doubt, to instill seeds of doubt in the commands of God. And so with this background established of Satan and Eve and what he's really after, which is marring the image of God, because if he can't be like God, then he doesn't want that for anybody else. Now, we need to really analyze the chain of events that are to follow. So let's go back the, to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 6. Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 6. We need to look at the chain of events that are to follow. We saw in verse 4 that Satan says that ye shall not surely die. And in verse 5, he's, he's trying to, quote-unquote, supply Eve away for her to be great, for her to be all that she can be without God. She can get everything that she wants without the obedience, without the commandments, without, without taking heed to God's warnings. And in verse 6, we see that the Bible says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7, And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, friends, when they both ate up the fruit from the tree, what happened? They lost their innocence. The, mm, they lost their clothing of life. Wow, you're actually a step ahead of me. That's actually where I was going. <laughs> but no, you're exactly right, because this whole time, Adam and, Adam and Eve were naked. They were naked this whole time. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25 says, And they both were naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They weren't ashamed. At this point, they still had their innocence. They still had the, the, the righteousness of God upon them. And some of us may be thinking, okay, so if they were naked, how, I mean, how did they not recognize that they were naked? Why is it that they weren't ashamed, ashamed until now? Well, they still had their innocence. And on top of that, remember when Moses went up uh, to Mount Sinai? He went up the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He came down, but then he had to go back up. But then when he came down again, the people were scared because they saw his face shining. And they were saying, whoa, 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 you need to put a veil over your face. You know, this is too much for us to handle. They were so shocked. He, was, he spent really intimate time communing with God for so long that he, that he was starting to, to shine, that his face was exuding the brightness of God's glory because he was in the presence of God for so long. And although the Bible doesn't necessarily explicitly, explicitly mention this in itself, I don't think it's too hard to claim that Adam and Eve were in a very similar instance, that from their constant communi com communion rather, 
and time that was that, that they were spending in the presence of God, that they were clothed with His glory. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of his righteousness. And as wonderful as this may seem of, wow, you know, they were clothed in, you know, the robes of light, you know, the very glory of God, which is amazing. But unfortunately, at this point in scripture, that's all done away with. That's all changed because of the, of the decision that Adam and Eve made of disobeying God's command. They are now experiencing for the very first time and in a very real way of what it's like to, to go through shame, guilt, uneasiness, you know, vulnerability. And efforts to try to remedy the situation. They both make coverings out of fig leaves to hide their shame and guilt. However, all the leaves and man-made coverings would not be able to prepare them for what we are about to see next. And so we come to our scripture reading of this morning. Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 8. The Bible says, now, ooh, we're, we're, friends, we're going to see something very, very interesting. So the Bible says here in verse 8, And they heard the voice of who? The Lord. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was what, friends? I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Beloved, notice how the Lord asks this question. Is he here with a belt saying, oh, Adam, you better come out right now. You know, oh, you don't let me find you. you know, <laughs> no, we don't, we, we don't see God doing that. Now, does God, does God have the right to do so? Oh, yeah, yeah he, he does. He and he alone is the only one who is worthy to be judged. But even though God would be more than justified in coming down in such a fashion, we don't see that. And verse 8 we see that God is walking in the cool of the day in the garden. And the language of, of, this, of this verse in the Hebrew uh, points to the fact that this was more than likely a common occurrence, that Adam and Eve had a set time to spend with God each and every day. This was a custom. This was a habit. So it wasn't like God was coming unannounced. This was something that would regularly happen on a, on a frequent basis. And so we see that God is coming along, walking again in the cool of the day, and he's wanting to spend time with them. Now, do we think that God is already aware of what took place? Do we think that he's already aware of the sin that took place? Oh, definitely, definitely. There's instances in Scripture where we see God being very vengeful and very aggressive when it comes to sin. But this is not one of those times. This is not one of those times. We see that God, he's coming along as he always does for the sake of companionship, for wanting to be intimate with them, even in the midst of their shame, even in the midst of their brokenness, even in the midst of the guilt. God is coming along as a friend, as a very familiar friend to them. Now, Scripture tells us Adam's response. He says that I heard your voice. He says I was afraid because I was naked. And, you know, he says I hid myself. But a bigger reason as to why they hid is because they thought that God was coming to collect. They, got, they thought that God was coming to collect on their lives. If we remember the command concerning the tree of the, uh, the knowledge of good and evil, we will remember from Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, that the Bible says, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. In their minds, deep down, they were thinking to themselves, Oh man, we, we done did it. We done did it. And God, he's, they heard his voice. They were thinking to themselves, God is coming to collect. And so what was the seemingly only rational solution for them? It was to hide. It was to hide from God. They thought he was coming to make do on his promise. 
being sensible of God's approach, their hearts were, were filled with shame, their minds were drenched with guilt, and they were dreading the possibility of our oncoming judgment. And at this point, it seems like the devil got exactly what he wanted. He accomplished in, in, in his personal mission in having humanity fall. God is here once again wanting to spend time, wanting to fellowship with humanity, with Adam and Eve. But where are they? They're hiding in the bushes from their Creator. At the sound of His voice, they ran away. They fled and they were afraid from their lives. And here's where things start to get very personal for us here, friends. Here's where things start to get personal for me. This morning, are there any of us that may be hiding in the bushes? Are there any of us here today whose first impulse is to run away when hearing the voice of God in our lives? And you know, friends, too many times, like with Adam and Eve, it can feel like the devil has won. It can really feel like the devil has accomplished his personal directive of making our lives just miserable. Absolutely terrible. As if personal victory is impossible. Is this true for anyone here? Is there anyone here today who's putting up a brave face saying, Happy Sabbath. Morning, brother. Good morning, sister. Glory be to God. But on the inside, you feel like your heart is breaking and on the verge of aching. Is there anyone here that, that no matter how you try, or how you plan, or how you attempt to maneuver certain aspects of your life to try to work things out. It just seems like nothing ever goes your way. That, huh, what's the, why should I even try? It's not going to work out anyway. Or perhaps it's a financial situation that's inches away from affecting you and your family, or a habit that's causing your life to spiral out of control, or a situation with loved ones that's threatening to break the bonds that tie families together into pieces. And so I ask all of us, including myself, in the name of Jesus this morning, the same question that was prompted to humanity all so long ago, where are you? Where am I? Where are you in your journey with Jesus today? Do you feel like the enemy has won in your life? As seen in the passage, Adam and Eve definitely felt the same way. They thought that the devil had won. They were hiding. They saw they were naked. They heard God's voice and they thought, this, we have no chance. We better hide. However, as we are about to see, the victories of the devil are fleeting and temporary. But the outcome of the battles we face belong to the Lord. The devil may have won the battle, but Jesus has already won the, Lord, the, the war. Rather, Now, following this passage, after verse 10, the verses to follow, we find something I like to call the blame game. So Adam, uh, God starts off with asking Adam what happened, and he says, well, you know, it was the woman that you gave me. And then God goes to ask Eve, as to everything that's been happening. And she says, well, you know, this serpent, the serpent that you created, you know, tempted me and, and tricked me and I ate. So no one is wanting to really take responsibility for their actions. And so they're just kind of pinning the blame on each other. And it's just kind of going around and around. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, in verse 15 of chapter 3, starts to do away with all of this. And beloved, this verse right here, as many of us already know, is the heart of all of Scripture. Genesis 3.15, the Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee, so talking to the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay, so we're coming to the, the big part of our study right now. So, this verse right here is what many of us refer to as the Proto-Evangelium, or in other words, the first gospel. Here we find the mention of the, of the gospel message first being promised in all of Scripture. And in and, and, and giving this gospel promise, God starts off by saying, I'm going to put enmity, enmity between you, the serpent, and between you, the woman. Now, 
Why these two in particular? Because it all started with them. But more specifically, it all has to do with relationship. A relationship. God is all about relationships. Everything that he does in scripture is for the sake of relationships. His relationship with us, his, the, the relationships that we have with each other. God is all about relationships. And this case is no different because whose voice did Adam and Eve hide from? Satan's or God's? They hid from God's voice. And earlier on in the passage, who was Eve talking to? God or the serpent? She was talking to the serpent. Now, before this chapter, Adam and Eve already had clear guidelines, clear structure of what to expect, of what they were supposed to do concerning being tempted about the tree. They were not supposed to eat from the fruit of the tree. It was a test of obedience. However, this serpent comes along talking to Eve, who shouldn't have been alone from Adam, but she com- he comes along talking to Eve and says, hey, you won't surely die. Your eyes are going to be open. You know, you're, you're going to be as, you know, you're going to be as God himself. This is a tree that's going to make you wise. It's desirable. No consequences will come. No repercussions will come. Everything will be all right. The reason why God states that he's going to put enmity between Satan and the woman is because right now there is no enmity. There is no conflict. There is no discord. There, is, there are no hard feelings, rather. The, relations, how, the relationship that God has with Adam and Eve, it's in a tough situation. And in order to mend the situation, in order to bring a full restoration, God needs to cut Satan out of the picture. He needs to put enmity between Satan and the woman. Because the relationship that Adam and Eve have with the devil is great. They didn't hide from him. But the relationship that they have with God right now is not so good. It's not so good. And so, moving on from this, from this part, the next part of the verse says, and between thy seed and her seed. Now, this is something that we need to really get straight because this is a part of the passage that very easily doesn't really make the most sense when we think about these things literally because God, right now, he's addressing this to Satan, but he's talking about Satan and the woman. So he's saying that I'm going to put enmity between you, but I'm also going to put enmity between your seed, the devil, and your seed, the woman. And so a reason as to why this may not make the most sense is because the devil is a spirit. The book of Hebrews calls the, all the angels ministering spirits. So if that's the case, and we know that it is, how in the world is the devil supposed to have offspring? How can he have seed? Well, I want us to notice James chapter 1, verse 15. And the Bible says here, Thus, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, or when it grows up, when it's matured, brings forth death. Do we see the language that the passage is using? Words like conceive, bring forth, and finish? This is an indicator to us that the seed of the devil refers to lust, which gives birth to sin, and when sin matures, or when sin grows up, it ends in death. Does this make sense? So, lust, sin, death. Lust, sin, death. This is the seed of the devil. This is what the devil has to offer, in other words. And so, with this settled, now we need to go to Eve. Because this also doesn't make sense. Because anatomically speaking, women don't have seed. And most times when seed is mentioned in the Bible, it's always with men. Whether that's Judah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, all All the time that seed is mentioned, most of the time, it's always discussed as men having seed. So, this would make a lot more sense if God said this part to Adam. But he's not talking to Adam right now. Right now he's talking to the serpent, and he's talking to Eve as well. And it would only make sense 
if there was one possible outcome. And, is, and it is that a child would eventually come without the help of a man. That a child will be born without the seed of a man. A miraculous birth, in other words. And the Bible even supports this by stating the following in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Are we starting to see the connection so far? Do we see that same word being used, conceived? In other words, the Bible is stating that Jesus will come to wage conflict with lust, sin, and death. Amen? Jesus will come to wage conflict with lust, sin, and death. And we saw him do just that throughout his life and especially on the cross of Calvary. But continuing on to the last part of the verse, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The significance with this part of the passage has to do with this word bruise, as many of us already know. In the original language, this word bruise means to crush or maybe to give a death blow. And so with it being the seed of the woman, Jesus, he gives a death blow to the head, to Satan, and thou, the devil, will give a death blow to the heel, of Jesus, his foot. Now, something powerful about this is that there's a difference in the severity of the blows. We have a death blow to the foot and we have a death blow to the head. The passage implies that when Jesus gives a death blow to the devil's head, as well as the lust, sin, and death, he's going to be victorious. There won't be any coming back from that. However, when Jesus receives a death blow to his heel, this will not end in death. We know this because he, of course, did resurrect from the grave. Are we together, friends? Isn't this a beautiful message? Isn't this a wonderful promise that God gives us right here? A literal first look of the gospel message right here in Genesis chapter 3. Where in the midst of humanity's present circumstances of shame, and bondage, God gives glimpses of a future that is filled with hope and freedom. But not only that, this promise is not just for Adam and Eve. It's not just for them back then. It's for us as well. It's for us today. Because we have the opportunity to look back on what Jesus has already done for us. And we have the opportunity to continue moving forward in life with the assurance that Jesus will make All things right. And so, church family, I ask again, are there any of us here that are hiding in the bushes, fearing the voice of the Lord in our lives? Are we fearful that God won't accept us? Are we so paralyzed with shame and regret that we are hesitant to come to Jesus this morning? The Bible tells us that Christ was foreordained and chosen before creation occurred to be our surety. In other words, before there was sin, there was a Savior. God appointed Jesus to be our burden bearer, our loving liberator, our faithful friend for these specific times. And when bound by their guilt, by their shame, the seemingly condemned pair, they were found in the bushes when they were experiencing the full weight of their sin and defeat, they thought that they were no longer good enough. They thought that, it's over, I guess. God's going to come to kill us. Whew, man, there's no way out. And sometimes we might feel the same way. Because of our mistakes, and maybe because of our shortcomings, we tend to isolate ourselves from the presence of God too, just like Adam and Eve. And despite this being true, because it is valid, we don't deserve God's love. We aren't in ourselves good enough to be in the presence of God. And yes, we are undeserving. That is true. However, the problem isn't that we aren't good enough. The problem is we don't come close enough. The problem is is that we don't come close enough to Jesus. 
We don't come close enough to God to seek mercy, forgiveness, and healing. And just as it was with God walking in the midst of the garden, as it was his custom to spend time with Adam and Eve, God, this Sabbath, is once again walking in the midst of this sanctuary, wanting to fellowship with us on a personal level. He wants to intimately commune with us as friend with friend. And in order for us to, in order for this rather to happen, we must come out of hiding. We must come from behind the bushes and present ourselves before the Lord. Now, is this easy? <laughs> no, it's not. It's a lot easier to hide. It's a lot easier to stuff our problems and run away from our issues. But remember, friends, Adam and Eve didn't stay naked forever. They didn't stay ashamed forever. And I'm not talking about the coverings of leaves. I'm talking about the coats of animal skins that they were provided later on in chapter 3. They were no longer naked and ashamed in the presence of God when they came out of hiding. And despite the devil's best interest to steal, kill, and destroy our lives, we are still here by the grace of God. Amen? As was his custom... No, as is his custom, Jesus has come walking by yet again this Sabbath morning to be acquainted with each and every one of us. He wants to fellowship with us, and he is asking each of us in a very personal and public way, where are you? Where are you? My friends, when Jesus asks me this question, I don't want to be found hiding in the bushes. I don't want to be so scared that I can't go to him. How many of us feel the same way? How many of us want to say, Jesus, here I am. Here I am. I want you to have your way in me. Take my heart, for I cannot give it. The Savior is waiting to restore our hearts and minds back to him. And let us no longer delay in hiding. And may we go to Jesus each and every day from this time forward. Amen.